We've got some fresh new young talent doing some things that I know you haven't heard before. One, two, three, listen. Welcome to Finances, your home for all things financial, investment, money, and lifestyle. Hosted and curated by the very talented team of certified financial planners at Burke Britain Financial Partners. Delta, you're joining me today. Well, because you take it in turns, but Ben's not here because he's uh, waiting on baby number one arriving. We're just talking about... The anticipation. Yeah, and I don't think any of us have got the date right. We had a little bit of a running quiz in, in the office and no one's got it right. I think we're, we're overdue by now about a week. Yeah, that's all right. We'll just look forward to a happy, healthy baby, won't we? So thanks for having me on. It feels like it's been a while. It has been a while. I think the last one we did uh, is actually pretty well received one it was time money and health today we're going to have a chat about a topic that maybe not everyone is aware of i had a meeting with won't name who it was but a person uh, in the amp circles talking about what's happened over the course of the last couple of years with advice reform and a lot of people that have previously had an advisor have found themselves essentially orphaned Mm. uh, without access to advice and some of them might not know they're orphaned. Some of them may actually know they're orphaned. Some may have actually gone and found themselves another advisor. But I thought what we'd talk about today is what has sort of led to this orphan client situation in mm. Australia, but also what people can do that find themselves in that situation. Yeah, so I think if we, you know, a little bit of history would be around declining advisor numbers. Uh, And that's based on a few different things, Uh, one of those being the education and and hurdle requirements for existing advisors in the profession around having a tertiary degree, the FASIA exam and so on. And I suppose the, the flip side is the cost to provide advice continues to increase so that it has meant there's been a, an exit of a large number of advisors and there's also less licensees. Therefore, there are, are less of us to take care of clients. Therefore, uh, we've ended up with a situation where we have these orphans, so to speak. Amy did a little bit of research for us before we jumped on and she found a couple of articles for us. One of them is from Financial Newswire by Mike Taylor, dated 31st of January this year, 2023, and titled, Advice Orphan Clients, a Sad Indictment. I might just read the first couple of paragraphs because it probably is to your point. It's a sad indictment that many orphan financial advice customers are now sitting in products without access to much needed professional financial advice because of the self-interest exhibited by lobby groups including industry funds always gone pretty hard straight up that is the assessment of long experienced financial planning business broker paul tynan who claimed that royal commission into misconduct in the banking superannuation and financial service industry had failed to understand the role of commission-based remuneration now i think There's a lot of angst. I had been a lot of angst out there in the industry for the last couple of years with this, with a lot of the reform. I think we as a business have been totally on board with Mm. the need to move to a a professional service oriented offering that wasn't necessarily based around commission. Mm. However, I think we would have to agree in some part with maybe what they're implying in this article that there's been potentially a bit of an overreach and that overreach in compliance and requirements has pushed costs up, as Mm. you mentioned, and it actually has led to a number of the the big players in the industry, them being uh, National Australia Bank Financial Planning, ANZ, I think it's uh, all of the banks, yeah. yeah Commonwealth yep. Bank. So a lot of their platforms, so NAB uh, had MLC Master Key, ANZ had One Path, Commonwealth Bank had Colonial First State, Westpac had BT platforms, ANZ had Zurich. Uh, some of the ANZ practices had gone over to Zurich, but a number of those uh, banks that actually decided, listen, the cost to actually deliver advice is far too much. So they mm. can't make a dollar out of it. And so they exited. Mm. And that's brought about an outcome which is the exact opposite of what was intended, whereby more consumers could receive good quality advice. I think the aim was to provide more advice to more Australians and it actually had the complete opposite effect. Exactly. The cost to provide the advice has continued to rise. As you've touched on, a number of providers have exited the advice industry. 
therefore there's less advisors to provide that advice so less uh, Australians can get access to advice. Now, I'm just looking while I'm talking. You might know fill the void while I'm looking this up about how many Australians actually seek advice. Do you know off the top of your head? I Delta? recall a statistic where it's something like one in eight Australians are advised yep. and the balance are obviously unadvised. I can't recall the study off the top of my head, but there's also some really good research around outcomes for advised Australians versus unadvised. And whilst they are tangible financial benefits, there are also lots of other benefits and that's around confidence in decision making, being certain around their financial future and so on. So for anyone that's out there that is potentially unadvised at the moment and thinking, well, why would I reach out for advice? I'll see if I can find that study and perhaps we can Pop link it in the into... Show notes. Yeah. 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 So I've just, from ASIC, this is 2019, research found that 27% of Australians had received financial advice in the past and that 12% of Australians received advice in the past 12 months. But even with those statistics, like that's you know somewhere between the uh, one in eight and sort of one in four, there's a bunch of Australians that aren't receiving advice. And since then, 2019, we've had the impact of a lot of the major players mm-hmm. leaving the industry and a number of financial advisors leaving the industry, which brings us to the point where we are today, where as a business, we're very much in the mind of delivering advice that's adds value mm. and I suppose what we the message or call to action for those people listening to this podcast maybe they were clients of NAB or, or MLC or Commonwealth Bank is don't be afraid to reach out mm. don't be afraid to reach out and actually have a chat with someone about where you can get some support and maybe have a health check on your current circumstance to see whether or not maybe you should be advised. There are mm. certainly people out there that might be better served to effectively manage their own affairs mm. with the right uh, information and being uh, well informed enough. But there's a bunch of people, because we see them every day, that come to us and maybe think that they've got their house in order, but they they don't. Yeah, look, I think depending on your own set of circumstances, perhaps, you know, you're at a stage of life where things are fairly simple. You don't have a lot of complexity or, or levers and things that need a changing and adjustment. But we're certainly seeing a lot of potential clients come through the door where that's not the case. There is a whole heap of opportunity for us to build upon what they have already in place, but put them in a better position through the advice process. So perhaps that's a a good segue, Jay, into what the process actually is. Yeah. So if someone's looking to actually get advice, one of the things that we would encourage people to do, it's uh, sort of tried and true, is that you should... First of all, speak to the people around you. Like Speak to the people around you that have actually sought out and got good advice in the past. You should do your own research, so you should actually <laughs> jump online. There's some great uh, resources. There is, I think the FPA have a, a great uh, resource for actually looking up uh, accredited yes. certified yep. financial planners and people that actually have the appropriate qualifications. Yep. If I can just jump in, yep. there's a financial uh, advisor record, so anyone that's licensed will be listed on that register so you can simply type in the name of, of someone local if you want to I suppose verify that they're licensed money smart uh, which is a, a government website also has very simple easy to use options around what you might look for in financial finding a financial planner so again the the, the message there is do some research first speak to the people around you so you've got an idea of where you might start. Yeah, and this is probably a message that we've spoken about on previous podcasts about the importance of personal responsibility. Like if you're taking ownership of your own situation, you've kind of got to do a bit of your own homework to get to the point where you make a good decision about who you actually see. The next thing you do once you've collated all that, you might jump on and and Google the person or the practice that, that you're looking at. And then finally, you make a decision to reach out. And that's where we would encourage people if they decided to reach out to us to give you a bit of an explanation about what that first encounter with us might look like because a lot of people are you know a little bit hesitant particularly if they've been burnt in the past with a bad experience with the bank or with a previous advisor or simply never had an experience so they they don't know what to expect it's the uncertain that's probably the most common isn't when you think about like one in eight or one in four people not having had financial advice before it is the thing that we probably don't do 
that well as an industry is actually explain to people what financial planning mm. advice actually is. And I think the challenge with that is that it's probably because you don't understand exactly what it is until you actually come in and experience the process and have it relate to your own personal circumstances. Mm. You could uh, reference it back to our Ben. You know, he's just about to enter parenthood and there's not a whole lot that can really prepare you for that experience. So you have to just be willing to take the <laughs> take the dive into it <laughs> and have that experience. So, yeah, I, I think don't hesitate to reach out. We're not that uh, scary. And the, the process is really for us around, as you touched on, Jay, perhaps you, you do some Googling, have a look at reviews, reach out to our website, and then you're more than welcome to book a 15-minute health check, which is generally the first contact that you might have with our practice. Yeah, so you can do that a couple of ways. You can either give us a call. So if you go to our website, uh, bbfp.com.au, we'll pop that in the link. You can call us or you can jump straight on, as you said, and book a time. Now, that time, that initial call, it's not that scary. We allow 15 minutes to actually just have a, basically, like you said, a health check with that Mm. person, understand what it is that may be front of mind, what might be topical for them. Like you said, it might be, we're having a baby. I don't know what to do. I've got a superannuation policy that I used to have with the Commonwealth Bank and I've got no one to talk to about it. There might be a life event, something significant. Our job in that 15 minutes is to gain a bit of an understanding of who you are and what you need and work out whether or not it's worth us making a time and worth the you as the person that's calling in and worth your time and energy to sit down with an advisor and actually look at it in a bit more detail of your uh, your personal circumstances. Yeah, and during that 15 minutes or so, it doesn't happen very often, but perhaps you've, you've called up and you have a need that we can't fill. You actually require another professional service. So, you know, we could point you in the right direction in that respect also. So let's assume we have that 15-minute conversation, Delta. We talk through a couple of your financial needs and we agree that it's worthwhile sitting down and having some time. What happens next? Yep. So you'll come in and we'll have that initial meeting. Uh, Generally, we'll ask you to do a little bit of homework in advance of that meeting, Uh, just formulate some of your current information, maybe collect some statements and things, whatever might be relevant to your situation so that we can have some uh, preparation in advance of our meeting. We like to think we're pretty approachable, so it's a fairly casual meeting where we do a bit more of a deep dive into the things that you have said have motivated you to come in and where we might be able to assist you. So it expands on that sort of 15-minute health check that we have initially. I think we we have a, and I'm not sure whether we can actually put this in the notes or not, I'm sure we can, but just outlining what that process is. Essentially, we're looking at people's sort of immediate, medium and Mm long-term goals and trying to help them fill the gaps with the goals or objectives that maybe they haven't thought about. And then we take an opportunity to actually go through all of the areas of people's financial circumstances. I know you like the analogy of the jigsaw puzzle, Mm. which is the one that we use. Our life is made up of a multitude of interrelated pieces, whether it be our income, our cash flow, our taxation, our assets, our liabilities, insurances, estate planning. They're all very wide ranging. yeah, Yeah. They're all very interrelated. So that initial meeting for us is an opportunity to understand each of those pieces. And at the end, conclude with the areas that we think we could add some value formally in terms of advice. Yeah, I think from a client experience, you know, generally when we're wrapping up the meeting and we're trying to get some feedback around, you know, the discussion and the relevance for them, it's often the comment that the breadth of our discussion is more than potentially what the client's anticipated. So as you've just mentioned, you know, a whole different number of areas, including things like estate planning, which potentially clients are not aware that we would address. So we want to make sure their whole financial life is taken care of. Uh, We're generally not just focused on one specific area. It's interesting because when we like people come with an an individual need Mm. and it might be consolidate multiple supers, it might be I've received a lump sum that I want to invest. As you start to step back a little bit, you understand, you start to appreciate just how interrelated your things like your superannuation or your investments are to your cash flow. Mm. and your taxation and your plans of how you'd like those assets to move to the people you love in the event that you weren't here. So everything is very connected and that 
to your point, is the reason why a lot of people leave that initial meeting and maybe feeling, I wouldn't say overwhelmed, but there is a lot to cover mm. in what we normally allow a couple of hours. But I'd say the majority of people leaves feeling as though they've had a fantastic discussion that's opened their eyes to areas that at worst they can take themselves and run with and mm. you know make some informed choices themselves about areas of their life that they might like to uh, improve on, whether it be cash flow budgeting or being more attentive to things like their superannuation or the need to have uh, current wills and powers of attorney. At worst, they've received some value from that, that meeting we've had. Mm. The next step, assuming that someone felt there was a need to engage us more formally and we felt as though we could add some value, what, where would we go from there, Delta? Yeah, generally in that first meeting, we would have touched on the areas that we can provide advice in and specific support. So if it was appropriate from that meeting, then we would generally prepare a proposal for those clients so that they could then uh, decide how they might like to proceed. So I always explain to my potential new clients that as a client, you are in the position of control. You dictate the terms of the relationship. So if at any stage you want to slow things down, you want clarity around fees or you know the potential strategies you're always in the position to make those decisions so we would prepare a proposal and then we would move on to the formal advice process from that point in time this is maybe going back to the original article we spoke about and the differences in the industry today as i see them to yeah. where we were previously historically the industry was potentially very transactional mm. and that you saw someone they sold you a product and then you never saw them again whereas you know because We've got 22 years of history of, mm. of managing clients that our clients are long-term clients. We maintain relationship with them for a, for a very long time and there is absolutely no benefit in us rushing people through this process no. to try and get product up and running or something sold to them. That's not the intent at all. It's about giving them an outcome that sees them making the most effective use of their available income and their assets to give them the the lifestyle and financial objectives that they're actually after. Yeah, pro product is the you know just the the thing that has to happen in some instances. When when we look at a strategy, if we need to have a super fund or an investment, you know that that's absolutely bottom of of list of priorities for us. And there's full transparency around fees. You touched on earlier. You know, the, the transition from the commission models, the fee-for-service. I mean, we've been a fee-for-service practice for... Since 2001. I was going to yep. say for 20-plus years, so it's nothing new to us. And we're very confident that we add value above and beyond that ongoing relationship fee that is in place. As you said, our clients have been clients. Some have been clients for longer than I've been here, Jay, so... It's a, a testament to the advice and services that we can provide to them. So if someone does decide to engage us formally, what happens? What do they get? So what happens after that initial couple of hours of health check and going into a bit more detail? What happens after that? Yeah, so that's when we would research any existing products or, or things that the, the clients might have in place. Often during that uh, first face-to-face -face meeting or, or Zoom meeting that we might have with the potential clients, we do ask some questions which can be a little bit confronting to the extent that we might question why certain investments are held in a particular fashion, you know, whether it's uh, by an individual, by both of them. And often it's surprising that clients haven't always put a whole lot of thought into how those things have come about. It's just been as a result of um, something that was happening at the time. So we do a lot of research around their current situation. We obviously have a focus on their objectives and their goals. And then we fill that with the advice. So the advice then enables them to reach those goals and objectives. So there's a research phase, a strategy development phase, all advice is in writing, and then we would sit down with those clients again after a number of weeks to prepare the advice and as best as possible, explain the advice in easy to understand terms, which can be challenging where we might have situations which are quite comprehensive and complex from a strategic advice point of view. So it is important that we, we try and keep things simple. And it's funny when you say we're trying to keep things simple, but we try to keep things simple in what is a complicated environment. And I think that's one of the, if there's something that's a little bit 
shocking to people when they start to think about their own circumstances, it is that there is some complexity to mm. it. And a lot of the time, and we're all maybe pressed for time and we've got less time probably than we ever have, we want things done yesterday. Yeah, This is a process that we don't want to rush, mm. that we want to make sure that we get the right outcome. And the reason we have a staggered approach and give clients the opportunity to have an initial conversation, an initial health check before we get on to some formal planning is it so we can leave no stone unturned mm. again. Sometimes that can be, well, I'll say frustrating, but can be, but I think we are doing a better job of positioning just the importance of mm. taking our time and also realizing that this is about it's an education process as much as anything because yeah. if we can have clients that are better informed, they make better decisions and then the relationship on an ongoing basis can be more fruitful. Yeah, and it, it's that spot on what you said around it's a real education piece. So, yes, the laws and the complexity of the structures and things that we have to operate within complex, but we do want to keep it simple for our clients. So we do also educate them along the journey. And again, just touching on a point that you made there, Sometimes in those initial discussions, let's say you have a couple, well, they might come in and they both, you know, sort of articulate their goals and potentially they're conflicting. So they might actually need some time to make some decisions first before we're in a position to really provide that formal advice. So even that process can be, you know, really good if you've got a couple and they can't quite agree on what the future might look like. So they might need a bit more time. I'll defer lost my train of thought now, Delta. Yeah, so sorry. We, I suppose we're at a point in time, Jay, where we've prepared the advice, we've presented it to the client, and then within our practice, our preference is that we implement that advice. So we make sure that everything that we have recommended actually happens and is implemented correctly. So yeah, that, that's part of the process too. Maybe the thing that is also unknown to those people that haven't sought advice before is that we're talking about the advisors and having a phone call with an advisor and then sitting down with an advisor and then having an advisor prepare a financial plan for them. But what sits behind us as financial advisors is the team out the back that actually make us look fantastic. Mm. And that's our admin support that help with the implementation of our recommendations, but also help on an ongoing basis, make sure that everything that we recommend that a client does actually happens mm. because it's all well and good for us to put something in writing but if we don't then implement it and I think we made that clear that a job isn't to give you a recommendation and then leave you to actually go and mm. implement it yourself our job is to give you a recommendation then help facilitate that and that's everything that's from establishing a new super fund establishing the investment portfolio buying and selling shares arranging appointments with solicitors to put in wills and powers of attorney, meeting with a new accountant if you don't have one, putting in place lending arrangements if you need to buy a home, anything you can think of that relates to your financial circumstances and implementing the recommendations that we propose, our job is to help you implement it and put in place. Yeah, we always use the building a house comparison. So we have a design, a build and a maintain section. So of course, if we design a house, then that's the advice and then we build that house. So we don't say, here are the plans to your new home, uh, go away and build the home. We, we do that for you. So there's no chance that those goals and objectives that you want to meet won't be implemented with the advice that we, we have in place. So someone's out there, they haven't received advice before Delta or they've had advice in the past and are now part of this orphaned group of people that are looking for advice. What is your call to action to them? Yeah, I think the call to action is to jump online, have a look at our website, have a look at the other websites and things that we've touched on, uh, do their own research. You know, potentially they want to meet with someone locally if that's their preference. Just reach out. There's no downside in you having that initial conversation with our practice so that you can be confident that you can move forward in that process. Beautiful. Well, I'll make sure that we put our contact details, our website, links to make an appointment in the show notes. Delta, thanks for the quick chat. Thanks, Jay. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you're keen to understand more about how financial advice could benefit you, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Burke Britain FP or Google Burke Britain Financial Partners. Check out our client reviews, testimonials, and make a time to meet one of our certified financial planners by clicking book now on our website. Thanks for listening. 
Any information contained in this podcast is of a general nature only. No account was taken as to the objectives, financial situation, or needs of any particular person. Therefore, before making any decision, listeners should consider the appropriateness of any information with regard to their particular objective, financial situation, needs, and seek independent advice from a licensed professional specific to their circumstances. All right, hit it. That translates to don't be a moron and act on what some random person says on a podcast. Take personal responsibility. Do your homework. Ask questions and speak to an actual human that knows what they're talking about before you do anything. PP Financial Solutions Proprietary Limited Trading is Britain Financial Partners are authorised representatives of AMP Financial Planning Limited AFS license number 232706.